I'm going to start with you, John, though, really, really quickly. I do want to mention this part. I know the reason why you came back to The Lion King especially was because you felt you cracked the code in The Jungle Book. So what did you crack in The Jungle Book? Well, we, uh, Jungle Book, you know, I've been working on both these movies back to back for about six years. And all the new technology that was available, uh, I had finally learned how to use it by the end of the Jungle Book. And, and at that point, with the team that we had uh, assembled for it, all the artists, because a, uh, a lot of attention is paid to the, the technology, but really these are handmade films. There's animators working on every shot, uh, every environment that you see in the film, uh, other than actually there's one shot that's a real photographic shot, but everything else is built from scratch by artists. And we had a great team assembled, and then the idea of using what we learned on that and the new technologies that were available to make a story like Lion King with its great music, great characters, and great story seemed like a really a, a wonderful, logical conclusion. And so that was something we set out to do. Yeah, I heard your son was very excited to like just be able to see it. Like, what, 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 um, what did you tell him going into it? You're like, just so you know, Daddy's a Simba. I didn't tell him anything. <laughs> I really didn't. It's his, first, it's his favorite movie. So I, I, I was like, oh, I'll just wait until he gets there. But somehow he found out about it, but still didn't know I was in it. He was just like, oh, the one with Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> and then during the movie, he's like, oh, dad's in it too. This is great. Bonus. You know? Aww, uh, even your, your son, you're upstaged by Beyonce. That's yeah. fitting. Yeah. Fair. Chiwetel, this Scar is way more similar, I think, to the stage version of Scar, and I think that's kind of amazing because we get to see more of why Scar is Scar. And I just want to know, like, what was, like, was that what drove you to him, the fact that you get to show, you know, he's not just a villain. Like, I felt a little sympathy for Scar for a minute. Oh, good. <laughs> You're weird, but good. I mean, for a minute. I didn't love him. <laughs> Uh, I, I felt that, um, you know, it was just really interesting to go into that psychology, to really sort of try and uncover that and to, to look at it. I'm a huge fan of what was done before, obviously, like everybody else, you know, with Jeremy Irons, and, and just sort of really just going back in and exploring that character again from a slightly different perspective and seeing what was there, you know, and it's, um, it's such an incredible part to play. Um, and so complex and, um, and all of that. And, you know, having empathy, you know, not sympathy, but empathizing with the character and trying to understand them and trying to get, get underneath that and such a rich, villainous character to play. So um, a, a wonderful experience for me. And I think, Alfrey, with your character, she's kind of the Helen of Troy of The Lion King in a lot of ways. And we get to kind of experience that for the first time in this film, at least in the film version, because John, that came from the stage play as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about it. Um, it is called The Lion King, but everyone knows that the lionesses are actually the rulers, the protectors, the nurturers, the hunters the, of, of the pride. And so um, John was able to give us the space to to be that. One of the first encounters I had with wildlife uh, was maybe almost 40 years ago in, in a, a conserve, and it was happening upon the lionesses, and you could hear the king in the distance. He was coming, he was, but they were sitting, and we were a little close to them, and I've never felt more afraid and more attracted at the same time. <laughs> That, it was that you, I realized I think that is the mother thing in most women and in some men is that, you know, th at the same time you suckle, but you also, you will, you will eliminate anything that, that comes close to, to uh, danger, endangering those cubs. So I, I just sat in that and I, did whatever John told me to do. <laughs> there was a whole slew of VR, uh, consumer-facing VR products that were hitting the scene. And we started experimenting with it at the end of Jungle Book and realized that we could build this really cool system of filmmaking using game engine technology and, and this new VR technology. And so we essentially were writing code as we were going for a multiplayer 
VR filmmaking game. And that way I could bring in film, uh, people who don't have any background in visual effects. We would design the entire environments. We, would pre we took all the recordings that we had from, from the actors. We would animate within the game engine. In this case, it was Unity. And the crew would be able to put on the headsets, go in, scout, and actually set cameras within VR. And whenever anybody visited, I would pop them into the, to the equipment. Did you all play the video game? Yeah. Oh, some of y'all. Yes. Oh, everyone? And it okay. Was yeah. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> okay, so, so JD, awesome. you grab mic. So tell us about the video this game. It's so cool. <laughs> it's, like, it's like watching your favorite movie, but everything, like, you're in it. You're in the movie. <laughs> that, that's, exactly what it, that's exactly what it was. You did an amazing job with this. So, <laughs> so it was me and Shahadi, Mr. Favreau. We put on the headsets, we had these little controller things in our hands, and we he were just- fly. Yeah, we could fly. It was, it was like we were Zazu, we, we were birds. We were whatever we wanted to be. And we saw everything, we saw the Pride Lands, we saw it, Pride Rock, we saw the watering hole, we saw the elephant graveyard, we saw it all, man. And it was so cool, <laughs> it was so cool. I mean, after that ring endorsement, when does this hit shelves? Because you just got like the best ad for this VR game, it needs to yeah, be on the shelf. It's a very specific VR game that only works for making one movie. <laughs> Billy and Seth, you guys robbed every scene last night and stole every scene last night. It was completely hilarious. I couldn't hear a lot of your dialogue because people were laughing over it. Um, so I just kind of have to ask you guys, how much was you and how much did y'all just pull out as you were going through it? You want to start? Yeah, okay, I'll start. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it was a lot of improvisation, right, yeah. Billy? Yeah. Uh, and, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. It was what was so nice, and we were actually together every time that we recorded, which, yeah. which is a very rare gift to have as a as a you know someone who's trying to be funny in an animated film, of which I've done a lot, and you're often just alone in there. And I think you can really tell that we're playing off of each other. It's incredibly naturalistic feeling. Um, yeah. And they really captured Billy. Like that is what is amazing. Is like I would say, like like he essentially played himself on a TV show for years, and this character is more Billy than that character <laughs> yeah. somehow. Which is I, it's like endlessly. It's a it's remarkable to me how uh, like his character specifically makes me laugh so hard. Um, yeah, they made me. I wish I was as cute in real life as i am in in the movie like the 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 timon they designed is so adorable um and i think the juxtaposition of my personality in that little timon body uh really works and and yeah i agree with everything that seth was saying it was i can't imagine now looking back not being in the room together no um because it would be like this uh, you, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I deserve it. It's cool. A, a little it. harder to have a great Bring rapport. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, being able to riff off each other and really discover our chemistry together in the same moment. You can feel it when you're watching the movie. I had not seen the finished movie until last night, and uh, I was shocked uh, by how much of the riffing actually ended up uh, in, in the movie. And, and I, think, I think it works, and I think it feels very unique to other movies in this genre? John saw what Lebo and I did. Um, the, the, there came a point in my life where somebody said to me, you can't hide behind a screen for the rest of your life. You gotta go out and look people in the eye. And we ended up t dragging an orchestra and a choir out to Coachella and doing Lion King life, and there was an energy about doing it as a performance and doing it live in that way that uh, moved John, and actually, to be really honest, it moved me too, because it was great seeing all these amazing musicians really playing it as a piece, you know, as, as music, as opposed to, oh, we gotta do it, we have to be specific about a film cue. So I said to John, why don't we do it like this? Why don't we get all the greatest players, to get my band, get the greatest players in the world, um, make a new orchestra here in Los Angeles, rehearse them for two days, and then really make it as if it was a concert. And we invited all the filmmakers that never get to come to the scoring sessions, you know, the DP and the editors and everybody. 
got them into the room, sat them in front of the orchestra. So the orchestra knew there was a bit of, you know, you know, they had to live up to something here. And we just went for it. But I mean, one of the things, if you want to talk about nuance, the, the nuance comes from the very, very, very beginning and the very first idea, which was, I wanted to make a Disney movie that started off with a voice from Africa and the black. And that is really my friend, Lebo M here, that something shifted, that everything shifted over into this continent. And with this voice, you know, I would invite you on a journey. That's all, that's all I was trying to do. Just, you know, come along, come, come along and, and feel this, feel this other continent. And don't ever forget this continent. Everybody who played in the orchestra, and it's a very special orchestra, knew the, the movie. So every note was played with intention. Every note was played with commitment. And I think that ultimately helps, you know, everybody. It's, it's not just people reading things off a, pa a piece of paper. They knew the material. And the rest, you know, John's a really good director, but there's one thing that he keeps bringing to the party, constantly bringing, which is this man has a huge heart, and that huge heart constantly resonates within the music. And I think, I, I think not just the intellectual John, who, who's able to pull amazing things out of technology, but the emotional John brings so much to this score. You know, and I mean, really, honestly, I thank him for letting me lose, letting us lose. One of the things I noticed watching it last night was the authenticity of it, um, from everything from Dr. Connie, when Rafiki speaking Kosa, like that was just such an amazing touch, I think. And when I look on the stage, we have black people from across the diaspora. We have black British and Florence is from Germany. What do you think really resonates about adding that authenticity to the African port. I want Dr. Connie View to talk about that because I know this was a very personal journey for you to do this film. Thank you. Well, I first thought when John said about to play Rafik and I thought to myself, it happens in Africa. It's somewhere along the track of the wildebeest millions moving from Kenya to Serengeti to Kruger National Park to Zodongwa and down in the KZN. Therefore, it is an African story. And he was generous enough to allow me to be an African primate called Rafiki. And the wonderful thing about it is that we're almost the same age. We're both over 75. <laughs> <laughs> so we've both lived we both walked through that forest. We both created those footpaths and intertwines where the little rabbits and the animals go through. And we've seen life, we've experienced life. But watching it last night, I kept praying, please God, not another scar in Africa. We've gone through terrible time. Let other people have scar. Not us now, it's enough for us. <laughs> so that for me was the kind of resonance and relevance in everything I do. I always try to find myself within what I do. And I felt last night like a kid for a very long time ago, you know, to sit there and just be taken by the story and look at these animals. And I'm very grateful to you, John. It doesn't look like me. <laughs> But he is like me, which is fantastic. And it's a story that I'm looking forward to our premiere in Johannesburg, where it will be full of all African people who are looking for something that is about them. We are sort of um, not uh, at the level of entertainment that the Western world is. Everything we see on the play, in the screen, we read, we take serious. We take that it speaks to me. And so I will wonderful to see how the Johannesburg or South African audience would say, what does it say to me? What does it make me feel? Why am I celebrating it? Is it humanity? Is it us? Is it our dignity? Is it our future? And is it what we want to tell our children? Label M, the song. I, I just, I cannot talk enough about it. Four of you guys returned, yourself and uh, Ms. Johnson. So talk about coming back to it and, and re-recording it and just getting back into the moment that you had in 1994 with Hans and with everyone else. I get a call, there's something about something that's creative that I'm going to do with Hans, we have a way of working. Then I see this and little drawings and I go into it 
and prepare to leave and I'll go back because something is missing. We create a because I'm just looking at this. And then I keep seeing this image of Mufasa coming out. And just as I was about to leave, I turned back and said, let me do one more thing. And I went, nah. And that was it. It was a demo. And we tried a couple of times to redo that. It just never wanted to be redone. What you hear is actually one take. It has been one take 25 years, years later. And how blessed can one be that in the movie last night, I'm sitting and watching this thing. That one take we did uh, because it was so natural. Now it has, it's going to outlive the previous 25 years. Is, is, is I mean, that's how you create magic, is just one take. Yes. Then there's Pharrell, there's everyone. And then when he starts the meeting, is what really touched me when John said, we are never going to compromise the authenticity of the original work. And that is so true, because not only is the new movie remain true to the original movie, but it's also remain true and respectful to the Broadway production. And I'm truly grateful as a South African and an African and an American, because I grew up here, who are blessed enough to be part of this amazing journey. And I'm still sitting. He's not tired of me. We fight a lot and we love each other too much. But I get to sit like this and say, I'm truly blessed to have a brother who has given me, and now we've gone around the world on the hands of Mato, And now who else has this type of opportunity to start the next 25 years in advance? I'm going to say to my hyenas down there, you guys are kind of like that couple that needs to break up, but they don't know they need to break up, but everyone around them we're knows in, no, they no, need to break up. We're in a very up. toxic relationship <laughs> <laughs> that we try to hide from our leader. It's like she's the boss and also our therapist. Yes, but we're like, yes. I'm not going to tell her the truth in this session, though. Because <laughs> we're gonna... Um, How did you get that dynamic? Because it is so different from the Timon and Pumbaa relationship. He's cool. incredibly talented and really, really easy to work off of. And he is a selfless, altruistic talent, which is rare. So I was in good hands. I was in great hands with John. Um, so I don't know. It just was a very nurturing environment and it made it very easy because I'm very, very sensitive. So the slightest wind... Of any kind of uh, of any kind any, will make any, any me kind of tear up. Yeah. yeah, we. Um, I think a lot of uh, John is a, John is a great student. Has an encyclopedic knowledge of of all different types of comedy, and one of one of those pieces of knowledge is about comedic duos and the dynamic that exists between them. And I know that when we had a very similar experience to Billy and Seth, where we were allowed to walk around the room, it was as if we were being directed in a scene in a play. And as he said, we were all mic'd, and so everything was captured. And then it was uh, the subsequent rounds that I thought got, was interesting, right, John, that would get a little more technical when I would be actually by myself. So I think I had two with you and then two by myself. And the refinement is also very fun because I would, we, we would sit there and I'd have the, the headphones on. <laughs> I would say to John, I'm like, now are we looking for Fibber McGee and Molly here or Abbott and Costello? What are you looking for? He goes, I'm actually looking for a little bit of Laurel and Hardy with an explosion at the end, but then back it up into a little Apatowian for me. And so, so, <laughs> with a sprinkle of beavers just, and butter. Yes, just, just a, a soupçon. A, a soupçon. Just a soupçon. Of beavers and butter. I mean, you're a chef in everything that you do, man. <laughs> like, you really are. I love this. Um, Florence, I have to talk about your character because I lived for her last night. I really, really, really did. I think hers was probably, everything was great, but you were the biggest upgrade in my opinion. I loved how, what you were able to do with her because she was fierce. Um, let's talk about the fierceness of you bringing, I don't know, talk about her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was lucky that I got to play the part already in Germany for more than a year, and we played like eight shows a week. So when you tell me who is Shenzi, it's like muscle memory because I got to play her every day. But this Shenzi is so different. I remember in the musical, we had sometimes shows where I was embarrassed because the hyenas are so dumb and funny, and they are entertaining. But this is so different, this experience, because when I listened to the dialogue or when I, when I read them, I realized that this is way more dangerous and more serious. I was lucky that my first day that I was in a black box and I was working with Andre, Eric Andre and with JD and we were very physical because the guys were so strong. It was easy for me to just be big and because everybody's very confident 
we could just really try out things. We could walk around each other, we could scare each other, we could scream, be loud, be big, be small. And it's like working in a theater, which I love. So having that freedom just made me, or I was allowed to do whatever I wanted to, you know? Shahadi, too, also was in the stage play, did Young Nala, and now you're also doing Young Nala in this one, and you have every black girl's dream. You share a credit with Beyonce, Carter Knowles, so, like, we'll, we'll love life. So what was it like doing both versions, the stage and, you know? Um, it was amazing doing both, and it was such an honor um, doing the stage play on Broadway and also doing it in the all-new Lion King. Um, and one thing that I really saw the difference was, was that on Broadway, everything's a little bit more structured. I feel like maybe Florence, you probably felt that as well. Um, and you kind of just have to like follow direction, um, which is cool too. Uh, but also, you know, um, in the all-new Lion King, I loved how John gave JD and I just a bunch of freedom, and especially Pharrell and Hans. We also had a lot of freedom in the booth. He was like, you can riff or do whatever, you know, just make it fun. And it was awesome, and I wasn't used to that, but it was still amazing, so I love that. And can I say that was the easiest, quickest casting I've ever had? Really? Yes, yeah, Sarah Finn. I was like, uh, get me a list, you know, because we put lists together. There was one person on the list for young Nala. And I was like, okay, done, okay, move on. You just why you, it was like, because remember all of these performers who sing in the movie sing, like they're really good singers who really prepared and, 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 uh, why? Thank you. I don't know what, who's getting a laugh? Is it, is it Seth? Seth, Seth had, Seth had uh, Hans and, and Pharrell uh, there uh, as, as his corner men. And, and by the way, love his vo love your voice in it. it. It's character. It's beautiful. It's some of my best stuff. I love you. You close you close the show on. Can you feel the love tonight? I mean, someone had to. And I. Uh... <laughs> All right, thank you. I want to thank the cast and the filmmakers of The Lion King for spending this time at the press conference. And um, thank you guys again. I really appreciate it.